I tried really to bring it more in a concept in what I think is now the modern way of thinking of decompensation, cirrhosis and ICLF. And therefore I start with these to the presentation and here we are. You know, this is a very descriptive study. But I think it's nevertheless very much an eye opener. And this is a predict study also coming from ECLIF and where you see that you have patients presenting in the clinic with a decompensation and this is shown here. But then the life expectancy and what is future development of these patients is so different. So on the one hand, and you see the time and we will come here, here are days is so important. First, it's a decompensation patient admitted to the hospital. But then in the others, there is rapidly within days a development in ACLF and more than 50% of the patients die within three months. And in contrast, you have a decompensation but then this compensation well solved, the patient is relatively stable. And then you have the long-term mortality after these 90 days, where you again can see when you start with this decompensation, what is called a pre-ACLF, then still, if you survive the first three months, the likelihood that you will die later on is very high and much higher as the other patients with a decompensation event. So I would like to start first a bit with the less severe situation, what can you achieve here and what are the most likely approaches in the future. And I think here it would be very important, the treatment of the underlying disease. This is basically what was depicted here. And you know what happens if the patient stopped drinking alcohol. I think the best experience we have from viral hepatitis, and even if you have a decompensated disease, if you then start treating the underlying disease, the inflammatory disease, you can achieve remarkable things with an improved improvement in albumin levels, with a decline in bilirubin level, and even with delisting in 30% of the patient being inactivated on the waiting list just by treating the underlying disease. But, and this is the most recent publication, I selected it because it tells you something. They looked on patients being treated at the stage of a cirrhosis, being cured and then followed for five years. So it's a very nice long-term follow-up. And they had a cohort of child A cirrhosis without any decompensation before, stable child A. Then at a cohort B, these were child A or B, but they had a prior liver-related event, but not an hepatocellular carcinoma. And group C was a liver-related event, was an hepatocellular carcinoma, but no other decompensation. And then they looked, what is the outcome? And you see here, and this is a five-year being cumulative incidence of liver-related events. And you see in the child A, it's much lower as compared to child B. And in child A, it's mainly HCC what develop. Very rarely that you have a decompensation with ascites or, or bleeding. This means really at this stage, you can change the long-term prognosis of the patient. If you had already child B is some decompensation. Still, HCC is the highest percentage or the highest group or patients most often develop hepatocellular carcinoma, but also up to 10% other decompensation events. And this translates in the five-year liver-related mortality if you come to the cohorts. So in a child A, you have a five-year survival of liver-related deaths of nearly 100%. But what you realize that people are dying then also from cardiovascular disease. So you have to also be aware of that, that you can have several diseases, even if you have a liver disease. But in the cohort B, you know, this is with a prior decompensation, the liver related deaths is already 10%, 12%. And this brings me to a very important point, and I will raise this issue quite often. It's how patients were managed. And you see here the gap between the first admission into an hospital with a decompensation and whether the patient was in any specialized care before and never referred to any specialized care, you can see this is by far the most largest group. So this tells you that patients being at risk for decompensation and hospital admission because of the cirrhosis had no specialized care, therefore perhaps the underlying disease was not treated and so on. So if we want to change also the burden of liver disease decompensation, we really have to take care of these things that are not related to new drug development, but just related to the management and that with the drugs we already have perhaps can help. So 
Here, this is the old-fashioned way of thinking, the physiological basis of therapies to prevent and manage cirrhosis. You know, you have a bleeding and then you treat the portal hypertension or you have a hepatorenal syndrome and then you treat the kidney and ascites and perhaps you implant a pump or whatever. But this is not what I want to talk about today. So it's really the search of a disease-modifying agent that really covers everything that is perhaps linked together. And here we can even think about whether we can repurpose uh, drugs that are already available. This brings me to the concept of systemic inflammation as perhaps a main and overarching driver in all the complications of, I'm missing a bit here the picture, but nevertheless, so that when it comes to ACLF as a most severe form of decompensation, if you like. We know that we have the HIT initiating event that by tissue injury, bacterial translocation, we have systemic inflammation as a main driver. And because this systemic inflammation may then lead to immune paralysis, then you have secondary infection and then this, the circle begins. I think this is relatively well understood, I would say, and good evidence from also basic science and clinical science. I think what is a bit lacking is the regeneration part and why some patients are able to regenerate and others not. And we know these if you have a hepatectomy that some patients may recover, others not. We know that fatty liver may play a role in whether you can recover or not. But I think this is very important and you will see that even if we are able here to treat systemic inflammatory response. If we are already in a stage where the level, let's say, is senescent, silenced of the regeneration, then perhaps we are lost without transplantation or we really need really absolutely new concepts of dealing with this. And just to show you the link between inflammation and regeneration from this study here, interleukin-6 or interferon gamma as inflammatory markers being higher in those with ACLF as compared to those with a DILI reaction. But when it comes to proliferating cells in the liver, you see the more severe the ACLF. For instance, with alcohol induced, you have no regeneration. And the second point coming to this immune paralysis, and then you have secondary infection driving this vicious circle, you see here that the more advanced the liver disease, you have a dysfunction in your neutrophils. I want to move forward again with this slide and to explain this new concept of the inflammatory response as a main driver, the systemic inflammation as a main driver in liver cirrhosis, especially when it comes to cirrhosis and then linked to ACLF. And I think there's now good evidence, and again, a completely different way of thinking, that if you look here and these different definitions, you have the pre-ACLF group, you have the unstable decompensated cirrhosis and the stable decompensated cirrhosis, the more advanced, the more inflammatory marker you will find on the blood of the patient. I think this is quite revealing, as shown here for interleukin-6. It also shows you the more decompensations event or the more precipitating event triggering, so it's not only an infection, it's in addition a bleeding, then these are these precipitating events with PE, you have more inflammation here shown with leukocytes and here shown with CRP. And then it's interesting what will follow. And you see that the inflammatory markers go down, in others there's a rise, and it's, you know, a bit how to deal with these various circles of inflammatory markers. And again, you can bring this together in this concept of the different stable, unstable, or pre-ACLF, because you see in a stable situation, you might have some inflammatory marker, but of course less than in the pre-ACLF, and it's going down. And the same with the unstable decompensation. Patients within the next three months will not develop ACLF by definition. But the ACLF-defined group, you have an increase. So perhaps people dying here for different reasons, perhaps really a bleeding or so related to portal hypertension, but not entering this stage of cirrhosis and this high inflammatory marker. Coming to this search, and just to give you a very brief overview, because I want to talk more about new drugs. What have we learned? Here are lists what, well, of course, they should modify the course of decompensated cirrhosis and so on. And I think for some of them, it's a bit unfortunate that these figures are not showing. What I would like to show you here is more the cascade with the systemic inflammation, where it comes from with the DAMS and PAM theory, with bacterial translocation, and this with statins, with antibiotics, and with albumin. You're targeting the very important steps in the development of the ACLF. 
process. And for statins and for rifaximin and norfloxacin, in at least some studies, a survival benefit was shown when you address systemic inflammation, let's say in bacterial translocation. I think it's interesting for norfloxacin, for instance, that it also tells you a story that you were quite effective in reducing mortality within the first, let's say, 12 weeks or 24 weeks in a maximum, but thereafter nothing happens. So this also tells you that some things that may work in a short period may not really prevent in a long term the patient from further decompensation. You can't see the ongoing <laughs> randomized trials assessing currently the available drugs, but it's really the main message is here. There are consortia evaluating statins, and the end point is really mortality. There are others with rifaximin, so the idea even combining with statins in order to improve survival, and this is not done in ACLF, it's done in decompensated cirrhosis. And there's a huge interest then in albumin as a treatment. And you know, there's a lot of debate and albumin has multiple functions that could be so beneficial in this concept of systemic inflammation. So there's a huge interest. And now here we're coming really to, again, talking a bit albumin and what I want to show you here. Well, of course, albumin binds a lot of things, also medication, you know that, but it has these anti-inflammatory properties being antioxidant, immune modulatory activity, and anti-inflammatory activity. So target events in the development of ACLF are really covered by albumin. And I think perhaps a really an explanation why we have so equivocal results when it comes to albumin is that perhaps we have underestimated really the level of albumin. To be honest, I was not so aware. I think this is really very interesting coming from the answers study. It's not linear, but it's nearly linear that the higher the albumin, the higher the likelihood that you will survive. And it's really this concept of filling the gap that you need a very high target, even super optimal, <laughs> above optimal, not only 35 or 3.5, but a cut of more than four gram per deciliter. And this divides or separates patients surviving an albumin and those not. So really a different concept. You have to go high. You have to fill the gap in order to achieve something in terms of survival. You may say this is a hypothesis still because it's a kind of retrospective analysis, but I think it's in a way quite likely. And from other studies, it has also been shown if you feel that the main action is to help to avoid these hyperinflammatory systemic inflammation that may occur by bacterial translocation and so on, you have to have high levels in order to lower IL-6 and these inflammatory markers. And this is shown here. You can give albumin at low doses, but this will have no effect on as a change in IL-6 levels. So I think it really fits into the concept of all. We, I think, want to see more data on that. So now I want to move forward more in the direction what to do with this group. I think quite well defined because it's only days when ACLF where have less time, the most severe form, the highest unmet need of getting new concepts, I would like to say, because it's not unlikely that one drug will not solve everything or one approach. If you look at ACLF in clinical trials, Gov, it's not so many, and it's interesting, many of them are on hold or so. Most of them are investigator-initiated trials, many of them also coming, for instance, from China. We have colleagues from China here or India, not many with industry support. And I think it focuses mainly on these three topics, extracorporeal assist devices, allogenic stem cell therapy, and I put here also GCSF, also you could put it here on trials, including non-licensed or novel drugs. So let me start first with the extracorporeal assist device studies. And to show you the most important one is the Apache study. It's a plasma exchange study comparing with standard medical care with an endpoint of a 90-day survival. We have a more investigator, again, plasma exchange with CCFF. We have the dial life. I will show both in a minute. It's a phase two study. And as a cytosorb, you know, the cytosorb filters, you can place it quite easily. The intensive care specialists like it because it's so easy, you know, they do dialysis anyway, and they just put the filter in. Personally, I'm not so much convinced about this concept because I think you are very late in what you are doing because the cytokines are kind of telling you that the damage and what has caused the damage is already there and it's a bit more late part. 
part. When it comes to plasma exchange, I think this is an interesting approach because it has shown to improve survival in acute liver failure. And you know that the pathophysiology has some similarities between acute liver failure and ACLF. So again, we have the hit, hepatocytes are dying, you have the dumps, you have bacterial translocation, you have this pro-inflammatory response with the same cytokine. And I think this will also be a play, perhaps an important role, that you have the endothelial dysfunction in this situation with more von Willebrand factor, less cleavage of von Willebrand factor by the protease ADAMS 13, and this creates organ damage also by a lack of perfusion, a proper perfusion of the end vessels of the organs. And you can remove all this and critics say, well, we remove good things, we remove bad things, <laughs> but perhaps in the beginning, it's more important really to remove all these driver that create all these organ problems. And again, a study coming from India from Shiv Sarin's group showing that you don't need high volume plasma exchange, a small study also standard volume plasma exchange, make it perhaps a bit easier so he could confirm the study and could quite nicely shown as in the 2016 study before that you can really remove all these pro-inflammatory cytokines quite effectively. And you have also an effect on these ADAMS 13 and on the von Willebrand factor being low if you treat with plasma exchange increasing in standard of care and the same with the protease that cleaves von Willebrand in order to avoid this like thromboembolism and dysfunction of the anterior vessels in these organs. So I think there is a potential in plasma exchange in ACLF because you can remove all these exogenous and endogenous toxins if you like and in the same way you replace albumin. There's still uncertainty in all these liver assist devices. There's well the evidence is always really not good. And if you have these meta-analysis and you do not have good studies, then also the meta-analyses are not very good. But it's a nice paper, a bit trying to summarize what is out there. They found at the end 16 studies that were randomized. And these are the studies where they randomized different devices against standard of care. And you see how big these lines are, how many comparisons there are between the ELAT. This is the one where you have, it's more these bioartificials where you have also hepatocytes inside and you have also two here with plasma exchange. And this is perhaps the most important one. So if you compare the different treatments and you look for the three months survival, the only study or the only device that achieved a risk reduction that was significant was for the plasma exchange in comparison to standard of care. All the other comparisons showed no clear picture. And the conclusion is a bit that the likelihood that Plasma exchange is in the first rank of the best treatment in this situation is quite high. And these bio-artificial systems, I don't know what your way of thinking is. I think perhaps really in this situation, you do not need albumin production also coming from hepatocytes. It's perhaps not enough what you can put in these bioreactors. And therefore, they are more or less like standard of care. So you need something more. So perhaps a conclusion that it seems to be the best currently available liver support therapy in ACLF regarding three months survival. But of course, the evidence is quite low. And this is the study profile or the design of the patch trial. It's interesting here in the beginning. So they were not not interested in the 1A, you can screen them. So if you have only one organ failure, but no kidney failure or no hepatic encephalopathy, or it's only kidney failure, but no encephalopathy. But if you come to 1B or the other grade, then you can go for randomization. And then they have a kind of a staggered design that depending on the response, they also stop. And I think this is interesting that you'd perhaps not overdo it because we know with all these extra copper devices, you know, infection by the catheter and so on. So only if you see some response, you can continue. If you already have a complete response, no ACLF may, you can stop and you have a screening period from 10 days. And for us, this is the main hurdle of the study because most patients were admitted to us coming from other hospitals where they're out of time. And this again tells you how important timing is. We are coming late, even with an ACLF where we know how the prognosis within 28 days is so miserable. It takes more than 10 days until the patients were admitted to a specialized center. Dialife is a very interesting coming from the A-Liver Consortium and Rajiv mentioned it already because it has the approach 
Again, we filter the toxin, but here the concept is that also albumin, because it's oxidized, is dysfunctional, and this oxidized albumin can have detrimental effects. So you have to remove it here together with toxins, and then in addition you reduce or you remove LPS. Now, LPS is a main driver of the inflammatory response in ACLF, and then you give fresh albumin. So perhaps in a way you cover everything, but you also cover it with a plasma exchange with a specific addition of endotoxin removal. It's a first study where it was given for five days in subjects with ACLF grade one to three, and they could quite nicely show, and it was presented during EDL ILC one year ago, how you can really reduce the pumps, the systemic inflammatory markers, also albumin dysfunction was improved, the dams, endothelial dysfunction. So in all these patterns, it was quite effective. And you see here that it's not survival of the patient. What is shown here is survival curves for the resolution of ACLF. So patient with resolution of ACLF are significantly higher in those being treated with a dialyte system, which of course is very promising as a first result. But you see 15 patients have it in early days. Moving forward to the cell therapies and whether allogeneic stem cells slash GCSF may play a role. Here we have one company developing the deal liver, human allogeneic liver-derived progenitor cells, the HEPA stem, and this is in a phase two study now. And I can show you some results of the previous study. It was more safety study. And then the rest are all investigational drugs, but using umbilical cord vein mesenchymal stem cells or bone marrow derived stem cells in this situation. Already 10 years ago, it was shown that these were umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells, they have beneficial functions in these patients with ACLF. This was perhaps not the easel definition of ACLF, more the apostal one, but nevertheless, you see that the MELT score improves and quite nicely you see the alpha fetoprotein going up. So these stem cells are there, perhaps not for a very long time because they go down quite rapidly, but they also saw in this study an improvement in survival. A second one in hepatitis B related ACLF, again, bone marrow derived stem cells, a significant improval in survival. And the authors thought, well, it again, perhaps related to infectious complication. So that was a conclusion from this paper that it could decrease the occurrence of severe infection or death, mostly likely due to the immune repairing and immune regulatory function of MCS, less so by their regenerative capacity, although this perhaps in the beginning was a hypothesis. Just to be complete, to show you here the, the studies that was published last year, Prometera is the company using these HEPA stem cells. As I mentioned, it's more a proof of concept feasibility study. It's not randomized, it's just a cohort, but you see in all these markers, whether it's inflammation, bilirubin, mal, child pu, you see an improvement over time. So, let me briefly move forward to the GCSF story. And GCSF is really an interesting compound because of its pleiotropic effect. And when you look that it has both regenerative and immunomodulatory effect, this is a magic bullet. So it releases endogenous bone marrow derived stem cells and thereby increasing the number of circulating stem cells and immune cells and could help in regeneration. And we have also seen that it could replace damaged endothelial cells because they can serve as an endothelial precursor. And also with this mode of action, they could have hepatic repair capacities. And then is all these immune modular for those in a way they are anti-inflammatory actions. This could help in a situation where you have too much inflammation and then, and this could be interesting, in the long term, it helps to improve the function of granulocytes and thereby preventing secondary or primary infection in this disease. And I have shown this to you just as a reminder. So perhaps we can treat inflammation, we can stimulate regeneration, and we can cope with the dysfunctional granulocytes. From the preclinical studies, they have shown they reduce hepatic injury, survival even in animal models could be better. They saw some hepatocyte proliferation in these animals. So all looks very promising. And then this study came out in 2012, 10 years ago. It was in a way really shocking, you know, in a very ill patients with ACLF. As you can see, these are 60 days, 60% died 
but with the help of GCFF, most survived nearly in survival of 80-70%, and they could show, we see here, progenitor cells, and again, they showed that they had less infections in these patients, so very convincing. It was then explored in other situations, mainly alcoholic hepatitis, but also decompensated cirrhosis. And here we come perhaps to the stable or unstable, and mainly in this unstable decompensated disease. And here the approach was not to give it just five days or 28 days, it was done in the ACLF study, to give it regularly over a period of a year. You start with five days and then every three months interesting concept. Here, again, a study coming from India, they again saw a significant improvement in survival and most likely had better control of ascites, but the most interesting finding was fewer infections in these patients in hospitalization. This is more or less the same group just published again the same protocol. I don't know why they did it again. Oops, I did it again. And if you do it again, sometimes there can be a different outcome here. It was not any more significant. It took some time, you see, that before the curves separated from each other. But you know, it's a bit borderline. And again, they saw less infection. So in a way, I think you can say, although it's not significant, a bit confirming what they found before. And if you look at meta-analysis in alcohol hepatitis, there's a clear survival benefit. And also when you look at the endpoint infection, then clearly it favors in all these studies the use of GCSF. But then if you look in European and Asian specific studies, you see only the difference in the Asian studies and not anymore in the European studies. And, you know, Cornelius, together with our group, did the largest randomized trial so far with GCFF in purely defined ACLF patients and you can't really see two curves because the two <laughs> curves are so much overlapping. There are actually two curves here. So we haven't seen any difference in these when we restricted GCSF to a pure ACLF cohort and a more recent review also could not find a significant impact or a significant improvement in survival when you focus only on pure ACLF patients. And I think this tells us a lot. We are now coming to the critical role of inflammatory environment in ACLF and the risk what you can do if you deal with the immune system, if you deal with inflammation, depending on the environment the patient is. I mentioned the importance of dumps and pumps and LPS as a main driver of the inflammatory response. And this is sensed by TOLAC receptors. And as you know, TLA4 is the LPS receptor, also the HMGB1 coming sense hepatocytes with a consequence that they are dying. So very important mark of the TOLAC receptor 4 and as mentioned, a major driver of disease progression in ACLF. And what Cornelius showed in that cirrhosis is associated with TOLAC receptor 4 related sensitization to endotoxin different from the acute level model. So you have more TLF4 receptors target making TLF4 a very interesting target for treating ACLF. And GCSF in this situation may enhance sensitivity to endotoxin and could aggravate liver injury. So it could act like a double-edged sword. And this is really what Cornelius could show in animal model. So if you have an animal model of ACLF, you give CCLF4, you give LPS, and you give CCSF, and this is two days survival. So normally these rats survive two days, but if you give GCFF, you give it, most of these don't do any more survive two days, they die immediately, but you could rescue with anti-TLR4, and this is his tech two or two. And in the same way, he saw regeneration by the use of GCSF. This gives hope, but because the animals are dying because of the inflammatory response, the regeneration couldn't work. They had no time really to show an effect here, but again, he could show it is very small, but you could really rescue both. You can keep the regeneration, even if you give TLR4 antagonists, this will not abrogate the regenerative approach. So depending on the situation where you are, and therefore perhaps it's really so important to realize, are we in the pre-ACLF state when the patient comes with a decompensation, or are we in a more unstable or stable decompensated? GCSF could be perhaps an interesting drug for the long term in order to prevent secondary infection, but in a situation where you have an already very stimulated immune system, it might be deleterious and may kill the patient, but 
if you try to block this inflammatory response induced by GCSF, you may have both benefits. Regenerative capacity, you have the anti-inflammatory capacity, and you have perhaps prevention of infection in the long term. Because although you can be always in doubt about the quality of the studies, I think if you see all of them showing in a way a reduction in the infection rate, I think this perhaps really can tell you something. And of course, this is why we are here. This is a concept. And you know that the A-Tango study explore both whether TLF4 antagonism alone is effective enough to bring the patient out of this critical situation or whether it's really advantageous if you add GCSF. Another interesting compound, there is a not so far a clinical trial in ACLF, but in sepsis and kidney dysfunction is recombinant alkaline phosphatase. And I really like this study because it also tells you, well, alkaline phosphatase for all of you, your doctors, we always see liver values as something that shows you damage. We never thought about that the liver value could be also a damage response. For instance, GGT is a regenerative marker. It helps a lot. And sometimes you see it in a patient you treat with an acute hepatitis that although ALT goes down, you have an increase in GTT. We never understood. And the same here, alkaline phosphate is an antimicrobial enzyme and it could cleave LPS. And it was very well evaluated with good studies in septic shock with acute kidney injury, because also kidney injury is an end organ, is also linked to systemic inflammation. And alkaline phosphatase has been shown to decrease this systemic inflammatory marker and has a detoxification properties in order to, by dephosphorylation of endotoxin. This is something also studied in ACLF, the detrimental effect of adenosine, um, G-phosphate. It's also a mediator of cell damage, if you like. But if it's dephosphorylated, then it could have regenerative and tissue protective effect. And alkaline phosphatase also converted the ATP to adenosine and therefore could in addition have properties. And they did a study, well-controlled study, published in JAMA, where the endpoint was the creatinine level or the EGFR at day seven. Very strict. And you can see here, although the improvement in EGFR was better with the alkaline, recombinant alkaline phosphatase, it was overlapping and did not reach statistical significance. If they would have waited for a bit longer, it would have looked different. And if it comes to mortality, fatal events, you see here with a kind of a dose depending effect. It really improved survival from, let's see here, 10 to 20% reduction in mortality. So this is, they are a bit discussing, well, it's published in JAMA and they are always very strict. Your study was designed for a clear primary endpoint. So this is the way you have to present it and you can't say this is a positive study. So it was basically a negative study, but nevertheless interesting. And these again are the work done in animal models by Cornelius also really trying to show that you can hear in a reduction of the upper apoptotic cell, if you have a model that induce apoptosis by adding LPS to bile duct ligated rats, you can mitigate or even push this negative effect by recombinant alkaline phosphatase. And the very interesting part is that you also have a positive effect in reducing TLR4 expression. It would be, as I mentioned, that it's more expressed in cirrhotic patients. So I'm coming to the end, just a few words on this immune paresis in ACLF and whether this could be a target for further treatment. And here again, as always, if you deal with the immune system, it's always a double-edged sword because you have pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, and depending where you are, perhaps you want to have a bit pro-inflammatory, otherwise you can't deal with bacterial infection if you are in a very anti-inflammatory stage. And perhaps an interesting reading is a quite recent manuscript. I think it comes from Imperial. They looked at the mechanism of immune paresis in chronic liver disease and what is the consequence in terms of potential immunotherapeutic targets. And the main message here is perhaps depicted here that in certain situations, drugs might be beneficial or unbeneficial. And quite simply explained, it's with steroids. We are using steroids in ACLF patients, but this is more the acute alcohol hepatitis. Now, we never tried it in others, but perhaps why should it not also work in other situations of ACLF? But we always have the problem that in the beginning we see a benefit. But later on, it's a kind of a trade-off with more infection and a higher risk of dying due to the negative consequences of the steroids when a patient is already perhaps in an anti-inflammatory stage due to the disease and you add an anti-inflammatory drug. 
but there's a lot of interest in these uh, new compounds or not well in dealing with these different immune cells and especially also in monocytes but really to summarize a bit here what the authors wrote that therapeutic strategies that reduce hepatic inflammation or dampen the systemic pro-inflammatory response need to be introduced early phases. And I already mentioned, we are quite often coming much too late in this situation. The late application here might be even detrimental. And on the opposite, therapeutic inhibition of this persisting anti-inflammatory response that is also present but could become dominant later on could be a strategy then for the late phase that you try to more stimulate these anti-inflammatory immune cells. And just again, a very interesting reading coming from GAT showing that the monocytes, as also cells mainly important also to fight against bacterial infection, if you compare the decompensated cirrhosis from the ACLF1, ACLF monocytes show this immunosuppressive transcription profile. So I come to the end and it's always good to think outside the box and you know there's not so much interest from the pharmaceutical industry in liver cirrhosis and ACLF, a lot of interest in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with anti-inflammatory drugs, with targeting the gut liver axis, the microbiota, and I think many of these drugs could be interesting. I think less so in the very acute situation of ACLF, but perhaps in the long term in preventing and think outside the box different reading. Hepatitis B entry inhibitor, you heard about this, bulivertide, but it's an inhibitor also of the NTCP and it's a bile acid receptor. And I think this is also interesting when we come again to the idea of why we have the lack of recovery in some patients and the lack of regeneration. And I found this paper really very revealing. They did it also with in situ imaging, what happens with the bile acid transport and all these bile acid homeostasis. So they had a model, but also they looked in patients of acetaminophen paracetamol induced liver injury. And they looked what happened after one hour and after two hours. And what they saw in the beginning that they had dilated bile canaliculi, but then they had a disruption of the tight junction. So what they get is a leaky blood bile barrier. So meaning that the transport on the one hand is disturbed, but because there's no more bile in the sinusoidal blood, you have more bile acids you have to take and then you're overloaded and then the hepatocyte will die and you have no chance for regeneration just by the effect of a secondary effect due to the damage and this damage is driven by oxidative stress and of course oxidative stress plays also a role in ACLF but if you then block the carrier with bulivertide with the hepatitis B entry and NTCP receptor you could interrupt the bile acid uptake and you saw regeneration nice so it all about timing. And I think this is really the most important thing. We can have the best drugs and I think we can perhaps also many studies and potential good drugs will fail because we are just not have the best defined patient. We're coming too late in all these things. So this really means that we need a kind of management change. And just to explain it to you here with this slide with hepatorenal syndrome, you can be so effective with albumin, and telepressin, this is a vasoactive substance. But what is done, and therefore the studies failed, for instance, in the US, they were only admitted if they have a creatinine of eight, they have a bilirubin of several hundreds, you know, they are already in an ACLF grade three. So the likelihood that you have a complete remission of your hepatorenal syndrome is quite high if you start early in an ACLF grade one with a lower basal serum creatinine, but it declines, of course, the more severe is the ACLF. So we want to save a science in London. <laughs> so, and you mentioned about the covers in JHEP. So I worked also a bit on the design of the Easel International Liver Congress. I'm always a bit smiling when I look at this picture. I hope you like it too. We really tried hard to give the liver a more interesting appearance than just this brownish organ. And you know, this is this ancient liver, you know, and you have the one in the National Museum in London. So there it comes from, it tells you the whole story. And this was a thousand years before Christ. And they always already realized, and this is from a sheep, that you have segments in the liver and thanks a lot. Well.